a hangout show, the issues and challenges of today's fire service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky along. Well, <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got one of my partners, uh, Chief Scott Thompson, with us. We're hoping um, uh, we get uh, Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, my, my hump day hangout co-host, and uh, our other uh, team member, Chief John Salk, on board. And uh, sometimes they get busy right before we get ready to do the show. So we're hoping they're going to join us. But um, again, uh, we're here. I'm here with, with one of, uh, one of the, the four or five of us, uh, Chief Scott Thompson from the Colony. Um, we've got another great show planned for you today with a very special guest. Uh, we'll get to Chief uh, uh, Freddie Fernandez in a second here. Um, as a reminder, throughout the show, if you have any questions, um, throw them out there uh, at Twitter uh, to us. Our producer, Mark, will pick them up and throw them to us if we can get to them. Uh, just make sure you had a hashtag FE talk uh, for fire engineering talk so we can get those. Uh, and again, like I said, we're hoping that uh, Terry and John will be joining us in a little bit. Um, uh, as a reminder, um, we got FDIC coming up in April. Uh, we're right in the middle of uh, those of us on advisory board with the calls for papers. There's been some incredible submissions. Um, I know we wear this one out, but if for some reason you don't get picked for this year, keep putting in. It, there's only so many. There's only so many so many class rooms that we could put people in, and uh, once in a while. Uh, disappointment leads to, to a little bit of anger and, and guys get upset. I'm like, no, wait a minute. We actually said not this year, but next year. Um, so hang in there. If you don't, if you do, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience that you'll, you'll never forget. You'll be hooked, especially if it's your first time. We're always looking for new presentations. We're always looking for new presenters. Uh, just like we're always looking for new authors for the magazine uh, to come up with ideas for articles and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, keep, keep pushing forward. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what I've been reviewing over the past uh, few weeks and still have a lot to go, but, uh, some good stuff. And a lot of us, trust me, uh, on the advisory board, in fact, everybody I know of, uh, takes it seriously, takes it to heart and we review everything. Um, uh, you know, we all just click, uh, okay, not okay or whatever. So, uh, hope to see you there. It's right around the corner. Um, uh, our special guest today is chief Freddie Fernandez and, uh, before I, I introduce him officially, let me read the chief's bio. Chief Freddie Fernandez entered the fire service in 1983 and rose to deputy chief for Miami Fire Rescue before he retired in 2014. Uh, chief Freddie served as a recruit instructor in 1990 and participated in dozens of officer development classes, which is perfect for our topic today. During his 32 years uh, at Miami Fire Rescue, since 1999, he has helped thousands of firefighters across the nation get promoted. He is the founder of FireAssessmentCenterPrep.com. FireAssessmentCenterPrep.com has spoken at FDIC and has conducted in-person training na nationwide. Uh, Chief Fernandez's coaching pass passion, his passion for coaching obviously is there, uh, is evident in every training product. And many of his students have been promoted multiple times using his methods. Um, we're going to get to it a little bit later as the author uh, of his book, The Fire Assessment Center 360, Climb Past Your Competition. But our topic today is preparing to promote to that next level. and what it, Everything that involves getting to that next position. Um, Freddie, welcome to the show, buddy. Chief, thank you so much for having me on. It's really exciting to be able to share some of this information and the same passion you all share to, to help develop the fire service. And if I could chime in on the FDIC, what an incredible experience. I, I've had the, the privilege of sharing there a couple of times, and I've learned a lot there. So. Thank you so much for having me on. No, it's an honor to have you. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I know this is a topic uh, very close and dear to all of us that are on this panel. Um, but especially, I know, Scott, you, um, I, I mean, besides all the things that you do and all the topics that, that you teach on, one of the areas that you and I are just so alike besides our love for the job is our passion for developing people. You've got a mentoring process. You know, we, you and I put that together in Louisville, and then you've carried it to extremes that I never saw coming. Um, I get people talking all the time about reaching out to you about how to establish a mentoring program, how to help people get to the next position. And uh, before we get to, to Freddie here, what, what, what are some of the, the key takeaways from what you do with your, your, your mentoring program that you, you provide to so many other people? Well, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, Chief, great to have you on. Um, and Rick, thank you for all the work you guys do to read all those proposals, man. I, I, I know that's a daunting task, but, um, you know, 
you're right. We, we started talking about mentoring when I was with you early, like 2002. And uh, that's when I really kind of focused on it. We had great success in Louisville, uh, mentoring our, our new guys and even our newly promoted. And so um, when I got to the colony, I thought, wow, that, you know, we had, it worked. So let's, let's kind of keep doing it. We've kind of created what we call a formal mentoring program. And, and not that I have anything against traditional mentoring. The only difference is, is that not everybody gets to benefit from that relationship. And so we wanted to create a process where everybody was able to, to uh, benefit from that mentoring relationship. But I'll be the first to tell you also, we can do a lot better. I think the fire service overall, we don't do a great job of developing our people. You know, I, I talk about all the time we spend on uh, specking our fire trucks, and then we don't do near that much for the officers that we put in. And I say putting commercial officers in a custom cab. So um, we're, we're working on some things now. We're calling Trumpets 1 and 2, which is going to be our next effort. But I like, um, you, to you, call, know, I like you to call them Bugle, Scott, so, so thank you. Thank you for not no, calling sir, them Bugle. And, and, and you know who I learned that from also. But, uh, <laughs> so and what, one is pre-promotion and one is post-promotion. But, you know, I'm always looking for the next greatest thing for officer development. And, you know, in the colony, we like to kind of do things a little differently we're, we're not following the, the, the officer one and officer two stuff. We're really trying to see what the needs of our people. We're still talking about stuff like emotional intelligence and problem solving, conflict resolution, motivation, inspiring, those kind of things. And so uh, that's kind of what we've been doing. Our, our mentoring program has, has worked just incredibly well. If anybody wants, uh, wants that program, I'll be glad to send it to you it's about 36 38 pages tells you how to get something started doesn't cost you a penny but that that's kind of what we're doing rick but but I, I we can always do better i think that's one of the areas that the american fire services is, is really kind of lacking in well and i love I, I love that saying that you said uh putting commercial company officers in a custom cab because you know we we <laughs> freddie you know john salk and i've been doing our company officer academy and batianchi's academy for like decades now and I'm amazed. I think we're the only profession that front loads you, Freddie. You know, you saw it how many years at Miami and everywhere else. And, and, and there's no department that's immune from it, you know, where you hire you hire a new guy or gal and you front load. You put through the fire academy, through EMT school, maybe even paramedic school, fire, you know, hazmat awareness, hazmat first responder, a little bit of tech rescue and all that stuff. Throw them out on shift or at your volley department. Then we do CE and drills. And then there, a couple of years later, there's a bump in a row. They become a driver. And then we promote to lieutenant yeah. captain and we do nothing for them. And then what's even scary is we do nothing, you know, for when they make battalion chief deputy and, and, and God bless them. The men and women running the whole joint receive the least amount of training for their positions Then I get called in as a consultant and go, what, what, what just happened here? You know? So I like that. I like that, 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 that the way you described that Scott with, you know, putting commercial <laughs> company offices in a custom <laughs> camp, but Freddie, so same thing from you to start things off here, your passion, you know, is on so many different levels for so many different things in the fire service. But let, let's focus on a lot of things that were featured, not only in your book, but you, what you do to help people prepare. What When did you first start seeing that there was a need to get people tuned up so they can get to the next level? Well, I think it's very important to understand that, you know, the premise that I try to focus on in the book and in my teaching is forget the test, forget the promotion exam. First, focus on yourself. And this process really should start years before you even sit down for a promotion exam. So I remember having one or two years on the department back 83, 84, and already I had set a goal for trying to become a lieutenant within five years, a chief within 10, I'm sorry, a captain within 10, a chief within 15. But the process really is more about, and it's I love what you talked about, Chief Thompson, about the mentoring. Um, I dedicated a whole chapter in the book just to mentoring and mentoring relationships and how to establish them, how to look for mentors. So what I really try to focus on is really let's prepare ourselves and talking about battalion chiefs and, and improving. I remember years ago at FDIC, I took a two day boot camp for battalion chiefs and there were four chiefs from around the country. And it was a two day class over there. And, and that's where I, I said, man, there's got to be a better way to get people prepared because I was so frustrated in our department. I'm sure you guys can share and all our listeners can share congratulations, you're promoted. We hand you your badge. We hand you your stripes. We hand you a different colored helmet. Hey, go do a good job. <laughs> and then I said, no, there's got to be a backwards way to, to kind of reverse engineer this. 
And, you know, what I always try to focus on is let's get really good at and then fill in the blank. Running emergency scenes, running a counseling session, running a meeting in front of an external group, an internal group, an in-basket, whatever it is that you're working on. Let's get good at it first. Pause. And I always pause after this. And then I say, and now let's learn how to apply it on the promotional test. So that's always been my philosophy is let's get good at the job first and then let's transition that to displaying it on a promotion exam. Well, and Freddie, you know, Scott has, um, we always, we always have fun with the, the, you know, the, the best selling book, the functional fire company, <laughs> but there's so many references to values and, and, and teamwork and what it really means to be part of something special. Let's roll, let's roll this whole thing back. Like I said, sometimes we, you know, we start off right at the Academy um, and then we kind of forget people later on. Just like you said, here's your badge, go do a good job. Then we jump you later because you didn't do something right. But so so talk to us about, you know, one of the things I, I've, I've referenced plenty of times is you, you need to start, you need to prepare to promote early in your career, I've told people. You know, I, I, know, I know when you're young and you're just, you know, you just want to be a firefighter, firefighter, paramedic, and you're getting into the job and you're learning stuff and you're doing things. But, I, you know, one of the things that, and we could touch on this a little bit later, Scott, is the positional line of sight mentoring we did where everybody's trained in the next position, really whether you want to be or not. And introducing a, a, a mechanism, if you will, to, to start to get people thinking about their future earlier instead of, right, Freddie, how many times a guy sit on a kitchen table, hey, did you see they posted uh, the dates for the lieutenant's exam? Are you going to take it, uh, Scott? Well, I was thinking about this time. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, there, there's somewhere there had to be a thought, like you said, you had a plan ahead of time in your head with, you know, where you wanted to be in your career. And I don't think the the first year probie has to be going, I, I need to start studying for lieutenant already, but there's got to be a, a, a jumping off point, right? Where you got to start thinking, I know there was for me, hey, you know what? I want to do that one day. What do I have to do to start preparing now? So maybe that's the question, your beliefs in starting early to prepare and, and what should they be thinking about? long before they're maybe they're even eligible or long before they post the dates for that promotional exam. Let's just start firefighter company officer. Well, Rick, that's, that's just that's such an amazing question. And I remember back when I was a probie, this is going back to probably July, August, September of 1983. And I had a company officer and I reference him in my book. His name is Chief James Fisher and he lives now out in Arizona. Um, but Chief Fisher was such an incredible mentor. And he would take myself, all the other young people at the fire station, and he would just start coaching us and mentoring us and telling us little things about how to do the job right, how to take pride in the job. So I remember him early on setting the foundation. And that's, I think, really what set the tone for me is having the right people. So one thing I would recommend, especially for younger firefighters, is look for that mentor. Look for that person that's doing the job right. Now, notice I didn't say look for a chief or a captain or lieutenant. It doesn't have to be an officer. Because leadership has nothing to do with rank. Leadership has nothing to do with title. So find that senior firefighter that's doing the job correctly and then start tagging along with them and then start looking for opportunities to, to expand. And I love what you said about knowing the position ahead of you. And I think that's very important is letting somebody, for instance, if you're a captain, let somebody ride in your seat you know, for the day, whether it's in the office or on a non-emergency call or something like that. So I think it's important that you start looking for little stepping stones and start challenging yourself uh, long before the promotion exam. Well, and, and one of the things, you know, that we've talked about here before, Freddie and Scott, you know, is when when young guys and gals come up to you, I'm sure they do, Chief, when they see you out on the road, you know, they ask you just that, you know, so I'm a brand new firefighter. What advice do you have? Or I'm, a, I'm getting promoted next month to a company officer, my first time ever. What advice do you have? I know what I tell them, just what you said. I go... You know what? Find look, find someone on your department, maybe, or even next door. Find that guy or gal, the great one. If you want to be a great firefighter, you know, like you said, there's a lot of books, a lot of great authors out there. We've got some good friends who do some stuff, but but you know what? Look to the person, find the role model, not the buffoon, not the lazy ass, not the person sold at a recliner, not the smart ass, not the person that bitches about the chief and all that stuff, or the cool, the cool bully we've talked about before. But find the great one, you know, find the one that we did a show, Freddie, on here once. Remember, Scott, we said, if you could go back in time, you know, who would you want to work with? Who would you want to ride? You know, and I was like, oh, my God, I would have loved to have been a firefighter for Tom Brennan. 
I would have loved to have been a firefighter with Chief Ray Downey. I would have loved to have been on rescue to, oh my God, just some, you know, the great ones. And not because they they were like bullies, not because they were goofs, not they, you know, they're, they were into it. I used to say, Freddie, that the, the people I looked up to, the people I hung with, loved the job so much you couldn't help but admire them. And that's why I, I love when you said that because we've talked about so many times. It's like, find the good ones to emulate. I mean, you know, and, and the same thing, you want to be, you want to be that great company officer, look for the good one. Just like you said, look for that one, fasten yourself to them. And sometimes you don't even have to, you don't even have to be in the same state. You can follow them, their lifestyle. Um, I will say this, um, and I've said this a bunch of times in the, the show, Scott, you've heard me say it. The, the greatest leaders I've ever been around, worked with, honored to been, you know, next to, or have studied, you know, ha, you know, have one thing in common. They value family. They all value family, you know? So that's the first thing I'm looking for. Who, who am I going to emulate to, to, in, in my career path? I want to find someone that values, that, ha, that, that values family, has those, that those core values of family, you know, in there that they appreciate, not just what goes on with the brothers and sisters of the firehouse, but you know what? They're good people at home because if they're good people at home, they're good people at the firehouse. And then from there, are they into the are they into the job? So I love that you said that, Scott. How many times? I mean, we've we we've worked so hard to get people ready for the next position. Um, do you you want to explain for our audience, Scott? We know we've done this before. Talk about the position of line of sight mentoring. You know what we did, driver. You know, firefighter, driver, driver, cut, so on and so forth. Yeah, you know we we. we we first of all wanted to make sure that, you know, they had a solid foundation in the, in the rank they were serving in. So there was a time there, you know, one of the things we were cautious of, we didn't want to throw a lot at them about the next level until they were, they're pretty comfortable in their existing. And I think that's sometimes a mistake that's made, but after two years and, and after we all talked, we would start uh, getting them ready to act in the next higher position on a temporary basis. And it, it would it, what we did, and I loved what we did in Louisville. It it really um, mirrored the promotional process. So not only were you, uh, you know, developing to step up as a as a driver, as a captain, as battalion chief, but you are also getting some experience in that promotional process. You know, to help minimize the anxiety and get used to studying. But we put everybody through it. Uh, we had a lot of fingerprints on it to make sure that that everybody was kind of in agreement that this person is is ready to move up. But we we had a a knowledge component, we had a skill component, we had a, a somewhat of a peer review amongst the chiefs and the leadership, and, and then and then we kind of paid attention to them when they got in those positions and made sure that the process was delivering success. But we did that for every operational rank uh, there in Louisville. And uh, then, you know, as a bonus, we'd even send them to ride a few places just to get another dose of real world exp uh, experience, sending them up with Chief Salka in the 18th Battalion. And so that whole process really helped us invest in our people and position them for success as we asked them to take on more responsibilities. Well, and I think we saw with that, Freddie, a lot of guys and gals that were like, you know, they used to say, you know, I never really thought about being a driver, but. You know, I, I just I just took a written from the same books that they generate the other tests from. I just did the same driving course. I just did the same pumping practical, the same. Hell, I might as well go for it. And we saw the numbers increase with, with, with people that were, you know, looking towards their future. So, again. And it was more competitive, Rick. We saw the gaps between oh God, yeah. one and ten. And to me, that's hugely valuable. I mean, to me, that required a higher level of preparation than if they had no exposure to it. Um, and and I, I really like that. Oh, and we saw the percentage points. Remember, Scott, we were we were looking at people's scores, Freddie, that were like <laughs> being decided on percentage points in the high 90s. It wasn't like this guy got a 94 and this one got a 76. It was like, oh, my God, the competition. But so that being said, I'm, I'm, I'm preparing people. We're talking about, you know, now the assessment. You So a, a firefighter comes to you. Um, do you, tell tell me if I came to you and said, "What do I need? I, I'm 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 getting ready, and I really want to. You know, we got a lieutenant's test coming up. Um, you know, this is our process. Uh, tell, give me some advice. Obviously, they could read your book, but give me some advice. You're talking to me one on one. What do I need to do to prepare? Let's just talk for right now from firefighter to company officer, because then we can go from company officer to chief in a little bit, because I think there's a couple of differences. What what well, would you say to me? 
I was going to share a quick story with you is that when I got promoted to battalion chief in 1999, one of my captains comes to me and it's my first or second day assigned to the new battalion chief. And the captain comes in and he goes, hey, Freddie, you know, you've done great on your exams. You've done a great job. But what can I do? I struggle on these exams. And I said, OK, great. Uh, come over here. Sit down. I stood up and I said, sit down in my chair. And he looked at me like if I was a man possessed. And he goes, the next exam is two years from now. And I said, yeah, but we start preparing today. So that's what I that's what I would tell that same young firefighter is start looking at the job description, start looking at the job duties of the position. Obviously, review what was on the previous exams. Talk to people that were successful on the last exam, and don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But always, if, especially if you have an assessment center type of exam or an oral board type of exam, is start looking for public speaking opportunities. Whether you're doing a, a station tour with kids or you're doing a pub ed event or something, look for presentation opportunities where you're speaking out in public. And then I think another big thing is that um, well-rounded approach. So I talk about it in the book about developing your village and your village includes your spouse, your significant others, your friends, and start building up ahead of time to that. And then if you have a, a test that's very heavy on written study and where you're studying, you know how it is, four or five textbooks, 10 fire department manuals, Start building up to that as well. Uh, start reading an hour a day now so that when the test is actually posted, you want to read five, six, seven hours a day, you can build up to it. Well, and you so should be I, cracking the binder, right? I mean, some of these guys, the first time they crack the binder on one of the books is when they're studying. I've always said, like you just said, you know, you should open up. They should be dog-eared and their little sticky notes and all that, you know, when you get ready to, to take the exam, you should have already made all kinds of marks and highlighted all kinds of things on there, right? Yeah, because in most exams, and, and I, I'm sure most firefighters can attest that typically there's some books that are relatively consistent on the exams, especially the department manuals. So your union contract, your operational manual, your employee uh, operations manual, things of that sort tend to repeat on most exams. So you could start on those early. And even if a version changes, the versions aren't going to be that you know, significantly different. But I also talk a lot about time management. Uh, everybody's busy. Everybody has kids. Most people have a second gig or something going on. So start planning for that ahead of time and start lining your ducks in a row. So you know, I talk a lot about time management in terms of test preparation. But you should also talk about your personal life. You talked earlier about family. If your family's not on board for promotion exam, good luck. Right. Good luck. You got to get your team on board. You got to get your, your spouse, your significant others to participate. And then I think that leads to a great deal of success as well. Well, and so I just had a guy hit me up and we, 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 <laughs> God bless you. Uh, Scott, how many times we said, please, you know, go to, go to Twitter and, and hit hashtag FE talk. And then I think some people are nervous about doing that. So I had a, just a guy pose a question uh, to me, sent me a message. Um, so, you know, he, he picked up, obviously, on your career in Miami. Miami's a big department. I mean, uh, that's over a thousand guys, right? How, how, how big is Miami now? Well, in Miami, you have two big, big departments, Metro side. You have City of Miami, which is my agency. We were 750 uh, sworn personnel, about 850, 900 total. And Miami-Dade County is the, is the behemoth. They're probably 3,000. They're very, very large. So you've got you've got that, and they picked up on that, and they said, "So, is there a difference mindset preparing um, on my three station department or two station department versus a Miami, you know, city of Miami?" Because you know, one of the things, I, I, and I want to throw you made me think about it when it comes to preparing, like the FDNY, those guys are always studying. I mean, they they tell you because they do the promotion every so many years. It's like they have study groups and they actually go there. They're, they go to schools at night, elementary schools that are rented out. And they're like John Salk, our buddy. That was one of his gigs was test preparation. And 30, 40, 50 guys would show up so many nights a week at, at this place. And they would go through and just, you know, 150 or, you know question test out of manual stack to the ceiling and, and preparing. And I remember Donnie hates got saying as soon as he got done studying, you know, for for lieutenant and the list came out he says okay good i took a breather of about a month and i started studying for captain he hadn't even been promoted lieutenant yet was to get ready so somebody asked that question just now freddie so i'm i'm on a three-station apartment and i'm not on miami you know i'm not in a big city because 
are there are there nuances, are there differences when it comes to preparing for the promotion that you see? You know, obviously the three station department, they don't do the study groups as much because they're very competitive. You know, there's there's only so many people, so many positions, if there's any. Are there any differences or is the same same when you're preparing no different size department? It should be, in my opinion, relatively similar in terms of seeking out those mentors. But like you said, Rick, you may have to go outside your agency to find those mentors because you don't want to share some of your secrets. Now, another key component, this is more towards test prep rather than personal prep, is there are certain vendors that will put on testing for small agencies that are different than the vendors that put on testing for big, big agencies. So, for instance, there's one in the Chicago region that specializes in a lot of the small departments. And I worked with somebody just recently from a small department, just got the fire chief's gig actually last week. Uh, but they ride two person engines. They ride two person medic, one person ladder truck. They're automatic aid. It's not mutual aid, it's automatic aid because they're just so small. So you do have to change a little bit in terms of the way that you run some of your scenarios. But the basic fundamentals of leadership is leadership. The basic fundamentals of communication are the same, whether you're small agency or big agency. So I wouldn't see it as a challenge if you're in a small agency, uh, but you just have to reach your tentacles perhaps a little further out to find those right mentors. And we've talked about that before, you know, the seriousness of the job when it comes to injuries and line of duty deaths, you know, the, the large metro departments are actually, if you look at the numbers, the minority when it comes to the numbers, you know, there's there's just under 40,000 fire departments in the United States, 62% are volunteer. But that being said, it doesn't matter the size. What matters is how serious you take the job. And if you drop your guard one time, you could be just as dead. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I did an article a while back, Freddie, you know, the most dangerous words of the fire service are not because we've always done it this way. It's be, the most dangerous words are we never thought it would happen here. So, you know, to, to, to that, to that listener, that viewer that asked that question, um, I think all three of us are on the same page with, you know, there are some different things that go on in different departments depending on the size, like you said, but leadership's leadership, mentorship's mentorship, you know, work ethic is work ethic. And, you know, whether you have a, two people in your firehouse or three or you have 15, you know, being able to lead that group and understand, I think understanding people, and I want to get to that, what motivates people, um, I'll, I'll say this, and Scott, you've heard me say this a bunch of times, you know, prior to teach instructor one through four for U of I for the Fire Service Institute for all those years, when I was a young firefighter, if I if I heard the names Abraham Maslow and his motivational pyramid of hierarchy needs and Edward Thorndike's laws of learning, how adults are different than children, I was going to throw up in my mouth. And then I realized, holy crap, that stuff's true. Every one of us lives by Maslow's motivational pyramid, and there is a difference between how adults and children learn. So studying people, Freddie, talk about that. Um, Scott, you 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 mentioned it in your book a lot, understanding people. But about you know, if, if you're going to lead people, if you're going to get to that position, you, you know, the whole, you know, I think sometimes we get so sewn into books and tests, like you said. Don't worry about the test right now. How about worrying about yourself, preparing, and the people? How important is it to understand how to coach, counsel? You mentioned it already, and lead actual people, not robots. Well, Rick, Rick, that's that's a, a soft pitch for me. I love that question because it's, that, that's really what I what I like to talk about. So, for instance, in my book, one of the authors that I quote or the, the great leaders of all time that I quote is has nothing to do with the fire service. And I might date myself here, but it's John Wooden, the legendary coach from the UCLA no, basketball. And then I talk a lot about John Maxwell, who, in my opinion, is one of the greatest leadership coaches, leadership gurus, got over 100 books. Uh, I talk about Simon uh, Senek. I talk about obviously Jocko Willick and those type of things. So what I try to tell my people and in, in, in that I work with is I always ask this question to my students and I'll pose it now. Can you briefly tell me the difference between leadership and management? And I let that soak in for a little bit. And then I, I get feedback from, from whoever I'm chatting with. And then I tell them, look, my definition is so brief, but it's so on point. Here's my definition. Leadership is about people. Management is about processes. So then I start evolving from there. And I said, you have to lead people. And you don't lead them with a checklist. You don't lead them with a performance objective criteria or some form. You lead them by getting to know them, identifying their strengths, their weaknesses, putting them in the right position. For example, delegating. 
A lot of people misunderstand delegating. They think you're dumping work on them. Right. And if you don't do delegating correctly, it could come across that way. But what an incredible tool to build somebody up is by delegating, uh, putting them in a position to succeed, giving them the authority to carry out a project, but guiding them along the way. So that's something I think is very important is learning those delegating skills, learning those leadership skills. But I think probably the most important thing as a company officer or any level, all the way up to fire chief, is listening. Listening, just listening to your personnel, realizing you should never be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You should be able to absorb things from people. If you have a guy who's great at hands-on skills, then put him in, a, in charge of a class teaching how to do forcible entry. If you have a person who's really good at techie stuff, like a younger firefighter, maybe he's really good at techie, well, have him show you how to do the technical stuff. So I think it's important to balance those concepts. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, like you said, understand, if you understand how teams work, everything you just said comes, comes, comes easy. Um, you know, to, to, if you understand what make your different strengths and weaknesses and how to observe and read people, we've said forever, we, we, we suck at reading people. We, we, you know, we talk about reading small tactics of strategy, which we're not that good at that. If you think about it, but we, we're really horrible at reading people where, you know, we, we, and like you said, the whole communication process, the biggest thing about that is the listening part. If you're listening to pay attention to your people, but the empowering thing, you know, Scott, you and I hear it in, 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 a, in uh, you know, assessment processes for fire chief when we're doing you know, as a panelist. And you ask that, you know, what, what, some of these candidates will say, so what is, what is your strengths? And I like to empower, empower people. And I'm like, so what's that mean? You know, and usually it's like <laughs> handing out stuff. And I'm like, no, you, you, first of all, you have to be able to delegate. Yeah, but, you, you know, you have to hold people accountable. You have to guide them. You have to help them. But you have to leave them go. You have to give away the tools, the keys to the kingdom, you know, to allow them to succeed. And, Freddie, you hit it right there. If you, if you, don't, if you don't delegate, if you don't empower the people, you know, if, we always – refer to those micromanagers out there. But, you know, if you don't allow your people the opportunity to grow and to take on responsibility, um, you know, a uh, difference between accepting responsibility and taking on responsibility, they're never going to grow. They're, ne they're, they're never going to get there. Scott, you know, you know, you've got, and I always brag on the colony, you've got a great group of people there. And I always tease you because everywhere I go, you know, I hear about Chief Scott Thompson. We just had Chief Scott Thompson. And I always said, God, God, does the guy ever not brag about his people? Does does Scott Thompson ever not brag about the colony? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, you know, you know that kind of stuff. And uh, so, what do you tell your guys, Scott? Either either in the colony, you know, your department, or on the road. You know, when should they be making that decision to promote, and when do you start your your process? Well, certainly what, what each of you said, I mean, it, it really starts the, the day you walk in the door from a, from a couple aspects from, from learning, but we also include a peer evaluation in our process. So that also starts, you know, it depends what the process is made up of. So I think that's part of the mentoring, you know, coaching is dealing with the here and now and mentoring is positioning people for future success. So if you do make a commitment to mentoring literally from day one, I mean, Rick, we have, um, we have a mentor meet our people on the the uh, apron of the firehouse their first day, and they read them kind of a short statement, uh, the, the most important thing we want them to hear, and then we bring them into the firehouse. But we make it clear during that week uh, indoctrination that that your your promotion and your success in this organization starts today, and we're going to give you all the tools, we're going to give you all the opportunities, but it's a 50-50 proposition. You know, we're going to commit to you, you have to commit to us, and I think that's the big thing, you know, we, we, we hear all the, the, the one-liners, you know, the job will give you back what you put into it, but, but what does that look like? And we try to explain that. We try to explain what be, being dialed into the job looks like. And, and I think that is when you talk about delegating and all these others, it's not, it's not saying do this. It's, I'm going to explain what I want to accomplish. I'm going to explain the why we're going to give you the tools and we're going to monitor you throughout. And then we're going to talk about the result and how we got there. So I, I think it, it's it's connecting the dots from A to Z and not just starting with ABC and letting them fig figure the rest out. 
And we spend a lot of time talking about that. Our most recent promotional process, it was interesting, came from the troops. They came to me and uh, they said, Chief, we really want a process that focuses on our core values uh, more than anything else. And, and because that's where we have our issues. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And we spent some time and we talked about it. But, um, you know, like I say, I think it starts now. The other side of that, you know, something that I'm seeing in the fire service now, and I think you, each of you will probably uh, agree to a degree, we're seeing some people that promote way too fast. You know, it's, right. it's not about hitting the mark every two years. There's got to be an experience and exposure component to that. You have to, you have to do the job that you're at and experience like we talked about the next level on a temporary basis. But these guys who come in and their only goal is to hit every promotion every two years. My opinion, there's a downside to that. It's a combination of the two. Exactly. There, there's some people that are, we've talked about that. They end up being, they end up getting promoted beyond their capabilities because they don't stop long enough to hone their skill, you know, to, to hone their craft, if you will, uh, at each level. It's always about the next station in life to, to get there. And I, I and, and, and that's a great point. I want to mention this before we, we go any further. Um, Chief David Rhodes, our boss, uh, through he's on the road, threw a comment out there uh, about, you know, you lead people, you manage things and processes. And we've all talked before about leaders promote values, managers enforce rules. You lead people, you manage stuff. And, you know, that's always been something we've talked about, Scott, right? You know, when you go to do an assessment, ask that question and see what kind of answers you get uh, when it, when it gets there. Now, and that something you said, Scott, led me to my next question for, for, for Freddie and, and Freddie, and, and I think it's uh, chapter four in your book, finding the motivation to prepare. Scott, you talked about what you try to do to stimulate and get people ready from the day one to be thinking tomorrow instead of just today, let's think down the road. Um, Freddie, let's talk about that, about finding the motivation to prepare, because that goes right, you know, it actually touches on what Scott just said about some guys end up, that's all they want to do is pin a trumpet on, they, they just want to get promoted, and I don't think, I think sometimes they get into a position and they go, this isn't what I thought it was, or, you know, I was an acting lieutenant or an acting captain and it was fun, but now I'm really in charge. So let's talk about that, finding the motivation to prepare, talk about that for a little bit, because it ties right to what Scott said. I, I think it ties perfectly. And also, you, you've you been talking, both of you have mentioned core values, mentioned family, and I think that's very important. So in this chapter, I get the, the you know, 800-pound elephant, you know, 800-pound gorilla out of the room early. I talk about pay and benefits. And I throw out there, hey, yeah, you're going to get pay and benefits to get promoted. But if that's your motivation, you really should stop reading the book here, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then we start talking about, I talk about affecting positive change in the organization. And I share a story there. I had a, a, a prospective client that called me one time. We wound up working together, but he was really frustrated with his agency. And I won't mention it. it's a large one in the in the Midwest. And he was very frustrated about being out of touch. The administration's out of touch. All they do is micromanage and find fault in the organization. And I listened, I listened, and he had a lot to get off his chest. And then I said, what are you doing? What are you doing at your level? He goes, oh, I coach, I mentor, I do training, I have volunteers. But and I said, okay, that's great. So we talk about that. Then I talk about things like, for instance, trying to make, uh, um, you know, support your family, support your community, trying to make change in the organization as well. So I try to look at the promotion holistically and not just, hey, is it dollar and cents or do I get to sit up in the right front seat as opposed to sitting, you know, facing backwards in the rig? So I think we have to try to find those motivations. Uh, I talk about legacy. A lot of firefighters in the profession come from a legacy. Um, sometimes it's an event, a trigger event. For instance, the Oklahoma City bombing, obviously 911, a large catastrophic event. Perhaps um, in, in our neck of the woods, a lot of hurricanes that we get down here. Um, I mentioned that, that that was one of my motivators. As a young child, that actually happened on my birthday when I was 10 years old, when an airplane that crashed. I used to live very close to the Miami airport. And I saw the firefighters respond. I saw the units there. And at an early age, I said to myself, wow, I love this idea of responding to emergencies and helping people. So I, I try to always have the, the person before they promote, just make sure that they're in the right place. Make sure that they understand the importance of being an officer. It's not about just barking out orders. 
It's way more than that. And I, I like to tell my students that because a lot of them, they want to focus on the emergency operations. Oh, how do we run this scenario? How do we run an MCI? How do we run a high rise? And I said, listen, that's important. We'll get to that. But 90% of your day is with your firefighters. 90% of your day is not on an emergency scene. So I try to look at, you know, try to look at the process holistically. Well, like you said, it's, it's, and we've talked about this plenty of times before, is as much as we all love going to a job, going to a fire opinion, those are bullet points on the job description. You know, I had a friend of mine that said, and he's, he was incredibly involved in the fire service, said even in the FDY in their heydays when they were running, like when John was doing, Scott, six, 7,000 runs a year with 48 engine and 10 to 15 fires a day, even then they spent more time in the firehouses in New York City than they did on the road. So it's about your people and, and everything going back in there that dictates, right, how well you – you um, you do a, 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 at a fire or a, at an pit an accident, but you mentioned something, Freddie. I want to go back to the legacy thing. We did a show on building your legacy because I had a guy come up to me in a class once and said, "You know, I got I got like you know 16 years here, chief, and I want to start working on leaving my legacy." And I'm like, "What what <laughs> what, what, what have you been doing? <laughs> you, know, you don't think they've been watching you?" And so. So, you know, you know I, I, my dad was a firefighter. We have a lot of people that, like you say, legacy was in their family. But talk about, talk to, talk to the to the first, let's talk to the first time, first ever, first one in your family firefighter that's looking to promote. The legacy had to start somewhere. You know, I've heard, well, you know, I'm a, you know, a third, third generation firefighter. Well, let's go back to the first one. That person started, you know, so the importance of starting or building your legacy has got to be huge too as well, right? Yeah, and I think I, I talk about that in the book a little bit about trying to set the right tone for your, your children, your family members, trying to show them, you know, an honorable profession. Obviously, you know, we in the fire service, we're very blessed that we are seen by the public as a very honorable, honorable profession. Um, so that's one of the things that I think can help motivate people too is that they find value. Uh, I get some students, I have one just recently that are in their 40s and they're just trying to get hired in the fire service. And I said, wow, you know, what have you been doing for the last 20 years? Well, I had my own business, I worked construction, I did this. And I said, well, what's driving you at this point in your life? You know, you're not gonna have a very long career. You know, chronologically, you can only do this job for so long. And they said, I just wanna make a difference. I just wanna make a difference. And they wanna find more, um, just just feel good about their job and not just the paycheck. So I think that drives a lot of people as well. Well, and, and, and the passion, right? You just said it. Passion drives success. We've talked about that before that, you know, that I, I'd rather hang with someone who's into the job and, you know, crazy nutty about, you know, doing what they're doing than someone that's asleep in a recliner. We got a dynamite amount of the chair and all that stuff. I'd rather have the person that does, you know, there are a lot of people out there that can wallpaper their rooms. I, I had a headhunter I worked for said, Rick, you know, they can have all the skins on the walls, but they still have to have passion. They still have to have, they have to take the experience and their, you know, the cognitive, the, the psychomotor, but they have to take all that, the experience and the education, put it together, make the whole picture. If you have just one sided and you started off this whole show by saying, don't worry about the test right now. Don't don't worry about the test right now. That that particular part of the process, I think you were going to worry about yourself and your abilities and what you have to do to prepare and your mindset and so on and so forth. I mean, there's so many things in your book that you know. I don't. I, I you, you hit everything. You, you hit you hit everything. Um, Scott, I want to throw something at you before I go back to Freddie here. Um, you do a ton of interviews, you know, and, and assessments when it comes for officers of all ranks, including chiefs. Describe what you're looking for when you see someone in front of you. And not to give away like Louisville's testing process or trophy club where in the in the um, uh, uh, rapid panel assessment, the quick interview, the three questions in 10 minutes, one of the questions, I won't say which one or what it is, they're actually grading you. And Freddie, you alluded to this. They're grading you on your command presence because next month you can be hired. You may be out there in front of a class of 50 kids and teachers doing a presentation and you can't go, uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, you, you know, they're grading you on your your. And there's actually, it's a the, Louisville's tight, right? It's got Department of Labor vetted. They squeak. Mm -hmm. Everything's been checked, but they grade you on your command. What do you what What are the what are you, Scott? You see, are some of the the do's and don'ts that you see people in the interviews on how you know from the moment they walk in the door. What are you looking for 
when they walk in, Scott. Um, and this could be in your own department, but maybe outside. So, you know, if someone calls you to be an assessor and in comes uh, Sandra or Johnny and you go, okay, what do you, from the moment they walk in, what are you looking at? Well, and I'm going to answer it in two parts to address the internal and external, but, you know, sitting on those panels, you, you want to see kind of how they carry themselves, right? That starts from the beginning. Uh, they introduce themselves, they shake your hand, and, and you want them to be um, engaging, but not over-engaging, right? Because that, that can be a problem in a, in a firehouse or in a leadership role. Uh, I want to see a level of confidence, um, not arrogance, but confidence and, and a, a belief in themselves that they have prepared and are qualified to do this job in their own mind. Um, I want to know the, 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 how broad their understanding is about the subject matter. You know, it's very, it's this, this organization, it's very hard to be black and white. I want to see how they apply the gray. And a lot of times that's found in follow-up questions. Uh, but as they articulate, they're, they're not just hitting bullet points. They're, they're kind of adding some color to it and saying, you know, uh, this is how I think, and this is how I approach things. I, I mean, everybody in this job is either a black and white leader who who has to have that or somebody who can do very well in the gray. In my organization, there's three things that I really want to test for. Um, and, and we know that they can kind of do the job because we have the step up, but I want to, I want to know their ability to recognize and solve problems. I want to know their willingness to invest and sacrifice because the higher up you go, the more you have to invest and the more you have to sacrifice. And then the third thing I want to know is how are they going to react when things don't go their way? Uh, yeah. and, and there's always going to be those days, right? And, and so I'm I'm constantly trying to develop a process in, in the colony that does those things. We, we don't use a lot of outside people, but I hope I answered your question. But those are kind of some of the things I look for in those rapid fire uh, you know, those you have a limited time with the candidate and you really don't have a lot of time to interact with them. You're just kind of going off of how they respond to a question or to a situation. Well, and, and everybody's going to be nervous, right, guys? I mean, every, there's sure. no, you know, if they come in and they're not nervous, sometimes I worry, you know, whether they're actually into it or not. So you got to write off the nervousness part of it. But, <laughs> but it can't cripple them either. They, the, the anxiety and the stress can't cripple them. There's, there's right. something somewhere in between. Right, exactly. And yeah, you know, and I've told guys before, uh, Scott and Freddie, you know, as if, if whether you interview for a firefighter or, you know, a company officer or chief, I always tell them, get there an hour early. And they go, what? I go, I would get there. Sometimes I would recommend you get there an hour and a half, sit in your car with your cup of coffee, going through your notes, going through your stuff. As our good friend Steve Chikorotis would say, practice your box breathing, you know, get yourself in the right frame of mind, the right psyche, the right condition. And then you walk in and, and how many times Freddie and, and Scott, you, how many times we do interviews where you're, you're, you got a whole day of doing interviews and they come in and go, Hey, uh, your next, your, your, your next person has been out there for an hour already. And you're like, really? I mean, first of all, it gives me a chance. We get them in there sooner. I can have more time to go ca ca catch up on things. But I tell right. them, I said, walk in early. And, and be, be, first of all, you're in there, there's the smells, there's the, you know, everything else, you're sitting there and you're relaxed and you're, you know, you're not like you're walking in, hi, I'm, I'm Rick Lassinger. Okay. Uh, they'll be with you in five minutes. And then you're sitting there trying to compose yourself. Um, the, the whole, that whole preparation thing, just getting your head sewn on right is huge. Um, I, I don't want to pass this up. There's two things, Freddie, I want to ask you. Um, one is uh, Kenny Hahn asked a question and, and we kind of talked about that um, uh, a little bit with the smaller versus the larger maybe career department. Um, how do you, he, his question, if you saw that was posted by Mark, our producer was how to implement these, these techniques on a small volunteer department of 30 people or less. Um, your thoughts on that, Freddie, before I go into my next uh, question. I think that's a great question. It's a challenge. And I've done some training in some very small volley departments up in the mountains of North Carolina. And I think at the end of the day, it's to understand the culture of that department, understand how they do things there, and also what their response area is, what their typical makeup of the department is. Try not to cookie cutter things. I hate anything that's cookie cutter. So try to look for ways to customize what you're doing to your agency so it works. 
So if you're in a volley agency that, let's say during the day, you're challenged with getting enough responders during the day, then don't start practicing a scenario where you have 10 companies with four person per company. <laughs> Practice your scenarios that are in line with your expectations there. And then I'm a huge fan of pre-planning. Just like we pre-plan structures, you, you should pre-plan events, exercises that are going to appear on your test, uh, whether it's an interview question or anything else, is pre-planning based on your agency and your resources. Another thing, Kenny, I think that's very important is find out who is putting the exam together, whether it's an interview, an oral board, assessment, whatever it is. Find out who's putting it together and learn their, their likes, their dislikes, what's hot on their plate, because most exams are going to focus on things that are current issues in the agency. Um, if they're going to put on, like Chief Thompson was saying, he does a lot of internal thing, and he took the input from his troops. And, and that's a great sign of putting on a, an exam that's going to be fair and is really going to yield the best candidate. Well, and, and I'll, I'll just go back to, and I'll, I know it's a, it's a, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we call it, uh, like we always talk about Scott's book. I'm talking about your book here, the, the Fire Assessment Center 360. Um, that applies to everybody. Even if your volunteer, I'll say this, even if your volunteer department has just an election and you get promoted, you know, they, you know, they, they vote on you in a year or whatever, you can still take this. If you want to, you know, I, I, sometimes, yes, it becomes a popularity thing in some places out there. We've all seen that. But I love when I see volunteer firefighters start preparing to pre like it's almost like they're preparing to take a career exam but they're, they're they don't have that process in their volunteer department but they're still studying they're still preparing they still have the passion they still are looking like you said let's be realistic if i'm running two 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 or two three whatever or my automatic my mutual aid or automatic age 10 minutes away let's be realistic about it. in our situations you can still prepare using the same tools you can still there, there it is, folks. Okay. All right. There's the shameless plug right there. Okay. You can still read this and apply it. You know, it, it's it's not just, just don't think this, this book is just for the career person that's looking to advance, you know, to the next level. I, there's so many things in here that apply to, I'll, I'll say it, Freddie, I, I think you did it accidentally. Maybe you didn't. That apply in, in the corporate sector. You know, I mean, there's things in this book that apply to all walks of life, not just the fire service. So you can be a volunteer firefighter and and read this and pick up on those things and formulate your plan. And then when the election comes, if that's all your process is, you know what, and you get the nod, guess who guess who is the better of all the officers or or at the top of your game, if you will, is the person that actually prepared. But and I want to do this, Scott, real quick with Freddie because we, we, the hour flies by like it's doing again. Um, without going any further um, uh, into another area, I, I've always thought the in-baskets, and you kind of mentioned a lot of things so far, Freddie. You have Scott. We just didn't call them in-baskets, you know what I'm saying? Um, you talked about situational stuff and thinking through problems and scenarios and all that stuff, You know, whether it's staffing levels or how do you fight the fire with 222 or whatever. Talk about the importance, and I'll throw this to Freddie first, then Scott, of the in-basket exercise. Because, you know, and Scott, we did that in Positional Eyesight Mentor. We came up with stuff with HR, and then obviously the promotional process did. But mo now I'm not talking a tactical in-basket or, you know, assessment. You know, the people, Freddie, you said it. The, the, the stuff we do the majority of the time, that's what your in-basket should focus on. Talk about the importance of that part of the process and how to prepare for that. The big challenge with that is that typically, unless you've had great mentors as a firefighter or even as a lieutenant, you probably don't have a lot of experience dealing with calendars, dealing with scheduling and staffing issues, dealing with what I love to call as curveballs. So if during a shift, if you could control when the bell is going to ring, it'd be a lot easier to manage your shift. But we can't control when the bell is going to ring. If you're a fire chief, you can't control when the mayor or the manager is going to call. And you got to drop things to handle it. So the in-basket, to me, I call it the foundation for all the other exercises because it shows you how to prioritize things, how to triage information, how to make decisions on the fly. And my favorite in-baskets are the ones that after you start, 20, 30 minutes later, they knock on your door, they hand you a couple more sheets of paper, and you have to adapt. Um, so the in-basket is the exercise that I would tell students, if you have, let's say, um, a role play, you have a presentation, a tactical and an in-basket. There's four exercises. 
they're not created equal. To me, the in-basket is your one that you should focus on the most because it'll help you with all the other exercises and that reciprocation may not happen with the other ones. So in-basket is very, very common at the higher levels, less common at the lieutenant or captain level. But I would tell anybody who's got that exercise, focus a lot of effort and time on that because once you move into the upper position, those are the skill sets that are going to carry you. Well, we've said forever, and not to not to demean fighting fires, but I've said, you know, pretty much anybody can go out and run their engine company, be a company officer. I mean, I'm, I'm not knocking that. It's a, I know it's an important role, but it's the stuff back in the firehouse. It's especially nowadays, the things that keep you from being sued, uh, complaints, grievances filed against you, saying the wrong thing, using trigger words, all the different, you know, how to be an effective leader instead of, you know, we've talked about it. What, what Scott, we talked about what did our, our good friend, my godfather, Alan Brunacini used to say, if you want to make everybody happy, go sell ice cream. Oh, ice cream. Sometimes you have to have that hard conversation. And I have plenty of buddies to go to football and hockey games with. I, I want to be around leaders and those people. And there's a lot of folks out there that don't know how to strike that balance. And Freddie, we haven't, we haven't even really talked about moving from like, you know, captain to BC to chief or from BC to deputy or to chief, because, you know, you obviously, because, you know, you're all over with, with, with your program and with your book and all that. We're talking, you're talking to people that are going from firefighter to lieutenant, lieutenant to captain, captain to BC, BC to deputy division district, whatever, and then to chief. Each one of those kind of carries with it uh, uh, some different priorities and tasks that you have to be thinking about. But, um, the, Scott, you remember when we had the chief? Well, well, they still have the chief's aid in Louisville. They have Freddie. They have uh, we we implemented this. Um, Scott and I did back way back when, like two thousand two. Um, and I wanted them as captains. I wanted captains to be the chief's aid, the driver for the chief. So you had two bosses in the buggy, right? And they only gave it to me as drivers, driver engineers. Now they're captains. And the hard part, Scott, you remember we couldn't keep them there because, and this goes to your in basket answer, Freddie. We always said the best way to, to prepare to be a company officer, go be the chief's aide because, okay, you got to take the written exam, but when it comes time for the tactical assessment, well, hell, you're already running fires. When it comes time for the SOGs, well, you already know that stuff. When it comes to the in-baskets, they're the ones. You've done the scheduling, the timesheets, all those things. <laughs> They're the ones that go, no, 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 here, here, you, th this is the right form. You're not doing They could probably you know, write the test. Yeah, exactly. What a great, you know, it was such a great thing. And, and if you think about it, that, that throws the weight back. Just what you said, Freddie, on the importance of understanding the whole job, just not the tactics of strategy, you know, the tactics of strategy of God, I say the word administrative, the running your shift, running your firehouse, running your department, you know, the whole picture like I said, anybody can blow a siren, honk the horn, and go out there and run a fire. But how about the 90-something percent of the rest of the day, those things? And you said it just per so perfectly with the assessment or you know, with the in-basket was is huge. Yeah, and as a fire chief, I think, and again, I don't want to I don't want to demean a fire chief, but as a fire chief, you run an incident so rarely, in my opinion, a chief, a fire chief shouldn't be running incidents. We have battalion chiefs for that. And but so much of what you do is scheduling and calendar management and appeasing people and making sure you're listening and, and not letting things fall through the cracks. You run in projects that go on for five years, 10 years, not a 24 hour project, you know? Well, exactly. And it's, how many times we said this that, you know, when you're a company officer, like the in baskets are a lot of, you got a guy that showed up late, maybe on the influence, blah, 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 harassment, things, so on and so forth and that. But then you make battalion chief and you're running a whole battalion or a whole shift, a whole department and some of the small departments, and with every rank you you climb, Scott, let's go back. You've been doing this for a long time as a boss, boss. You know, the things you were exposed to as a firefighter, when you may, you know, every every rank you climb, you go, the 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 personal personnel stuff you're exposed to is incredible. The higher you go, all of a sudden now you're being exposed to personal things on people's lives that you, you go, what? Yeah, there. This person's got. The, I mean, there's things and the confidentiality of it, and not running your mouth and all that. There, there's a fire service maturity thing, Scott, that comes with that promotion as well, right? There, there certainly is. And chief, I'm gonna disagree with you on that, though. I still like going to fire, so we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> Me on that too. <laughs> but but I, I hear what you're saying. No, no, there is, and you know, somebody told me, and I don't remember who it was recently. 
you know, they said as a firefighter, they said when they became an officer, they would never do those things. But then when they got in that position, they were going like, oh, I get it now. I, I understand. <laughs> right. But yeah, there, there's so many things. And, and the more responsibility you get, obviously, that's one thing. But people treat you differently and your interactions become different. And and all those things play into it. But yeah, you, you got to be more in tune to to laws and rules and regulations. You, you got to have a greater understanding of the HR function and to a degree the finance function. And and you know, I, I was I was pretty disappointed in myself recently. We were talking, you know, my ops chief retired, and uh one of the battalion chiefs, you know, came to me and said, I've I've never really been exposed to that level of the budget. Well, sh shame on us. And, and so all those things you got to have a much broader understanding while still staying relevant and proficient, I believe, at the job. You know, you never want to totally lose track of the men and women and riding the rigs and, and what they, their challenges are day in and day out. But you have to you have to learn so much more and understand so many things more the higher you go. And, and, and that's all just a great challenge. And some of that comes through education and training and the other comes through experience. Well, and, and, and Freddie, we've had uh... Uh, we're going to go a couple minutes over here, obviously, and that happens all the time. Um, we've had a guest on here several times. Uh, he just retired. He's out there teaching. Uh, Battalion Chief Jerry Wells worked with Scott and I, and uh, dad was a, I know his dad would never agree. I always call him legendary uh, officer within a Dallas Fire Department. Um, that being said, um, I, Scott, do you remember, you know, we talked about it when we had Jerry on the show. He came into my office after being a Battalion Chief Golly, for about a month, Freddie, he came into my office. He took his cell phone and he threw it on my desk. He goes, I need a new one. This one's broken. I go, and I looked at it. I go, but it's still lighting up. What do you mean? He goes, well, no. He goes, it works. He goes, it doesn't ring anymore. And I go, oh, that's because you're chief now. He goes, no, no, no. I'm still a good guy. I go, yeah, well, I'm still a good guy too, but you're a chief now. He goes, no, 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 chief, really. I really am still a good guy. I go, so am I, but you're a big boss now. I go, when, when, when you walk in the yeah when you yeah. walk in the firehouse uh do, do 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 they do they do they stop talking does anybody get up and walk away from the kitchen table or whatever I mean you know life has changed for you with this new position but uh it's exactly that Scott it's like how do we get people to prepare for that next level but so let, let's let's do this we kind of when we close things out Freddie I wish we had three hours for you I wish, I wish we had like we, we talked about to our, our listeners our viewers, before we went live, we were talking with, with you know, with, with Freddie, with Chief Fernandez about how the hour just flies by. And it's like, God, I wish you, I wish we had two or three hours, you know, to keep going, but we don't. So we always look for um, an advice column, you know, um, you know, the, 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 well, nobody knows who Ann Landers is. Anyway, that being said, uh, the summarization, what advice would you give? Let's talk about, and again, we're going to talk about, you know, we'll finish talking about your book and how they can get it. But what advice, let's talk about the assessment process, whether it's recapping some of the things we talked or not, kind of give us a little bit of advice, how to prepare for that next level. If you could summarize for us, what were some of the, 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 the big, the big, the big rockets you would talk about? I think the, the big thing that I like to share is find your mentors, find the right people, start tagging along with them, start learning the job from people that are doing it correctly. Now, mentors can be at any level. You can find somebody at your peer, somebody below you, somebody above you, but get the, the, the book knowledge out of the way, the fire officer one or two, the fire inspector, fire instructor, whatever the, the parameters are, get those out of the way relatively early, but focus on doing the job. Forget the exam, forget the oral interview, forget the in basket, forget whatever scenario it is. Learn how to do the job. And if you don't know how to do the job, then nobody can coach you. Nobody can help you do well on a test. You've got to know the job first. You mentioned earlier, Rick, that I, I the book has a lot of things in it that could work for the corporate world, for volley. Yeah. I purposely did that. And I quoted the Maxwell's and Dr. Eric Thomas um, the, the, the Jocko Willinks and, and, and outside sources, because I want people to look at things holistically. And it's not necessarily when you move up the ranks about being the best guy at swinging an ax or forcing a door. It's that total picture, knowing your paperwork side, knowing your, how to conduct a training session, how to conduct a public education section. And as you go up, you guys have probably done this many times, how to speak in front of the elected officials. You have to manage the elected officials completely different than you're going to manage a group of firefighters, right? 
So I like to look at the process holistically. And you said it earlier, Rick, if you wait till they post the opening for the exam, I think you're so far behind the curve. I, I honestly don't even want to work with people like that that waited until it got posted. Um, so, so start the process early, look for your mentors, look for your coaches, and try to emulate what those people are doing. And if you could do that on the test, you're very likely to do well. Oh, and, and, if, and, and you referred to it again, uh, and I'm going to do this again, folks. Here it is. Uh, we get the reflection out of there so you can see it a little bit better. Um, Freddie, if, if, they, if, the, if they wanted to get a copy of your book, which I think is an awesome book, um, if they want to get a copy, two ways. If they just want to get a copy, best way. If they want to get one signed by you, because I like getting all my books that I get from people signed. I'll, I'll send it to them just to have them sign it because I just I love the personal. So if they want to just buy a copy, what's the best way? And if they want to get one signed from you, what's the best way? Well, I appreciate that. If they want to buy the book, it's Fire Assessment Center 360. Uh, and the, the goal was to prepare holistically for the process. That's why I love the 360 analogy. They could buy the book. It's print or digital on any of the platforms. You go to Amazon, bookbaby.com, any of the, the platforms, the book will be available there. A lot of noticing, I'm noticing in the sales that a lot of the younger people, especially by the digital version, I'm old school. I want the book in my hand. I want to be able to highlight and dog ear pages. Now, if they want to get a signed uh, version, they can go to my website, fireassessmentcenterprep.com. They can contact me through there, or they can just send me an email, chieffreddy at gmail.com. And it's F-R-E-D-D-I-E, chieffreddy at gmail.com. Or my website's fireassessmentcenterprep.com. And they can just contact me there, and I can elaborate a little bit more about how the training works, how the programs work. Uh, but what I don't want anybody to do is think, hey, I'm going to buy the book and do better on the test. Uh, the book is just the foundation, to the building block for you to build on. So, so I'd they, love to sign the book. And, and again, like I said, I want to make sure I mention that. And and you got it. You you did it. You already answered the question. That Scott always asks, how can they get a hold of you um, if they want to have you come out and help them prepare, do a class, contract with you, whatever. And they've got the website. They've got your email. Um, uh, hang in there for a second, Freddie. Scott, closing thoughts on the whole assessment process. And like the title we did this show, prepare to promote to the next level. I'm going to tie on to what Chief Hernandez said. And, and you know, I say understand the jobs. And I, I say it plural. Running the firehouse business is one. And then everything we do when we, when we go out the door. But it's been my experience, with the exception of those situations where it's just a written test, pass or fail, and that's how they score, the civil service types. Usually those that are most dialed in, that, 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 you know, are into the job, that go to training, that stay relevant, that listen to podcasts, read books, and then that talk shop with those mentors and those coaches, those people typically do pretty good. But also remember that it starts day one. You know, every day you walk in the firehouse, um, you, that legacy begins, but also, you know, part of that, that, promotional process, if, if there is a peer evaluation, if there is an interview, those first impressions, you know, dedicate, make those sacrifices and investments. To me, all those things are, are things that I want to see in a, in a good process. And so just, just be a student of the job and ask why and, and learn things, not to get the answer, but to understand things though, that, so that you can get to the answer be a problem solver in that aspect so that you can figure it out. And, and that's always helped me is understanding the why to deduct or, or to, to, uh, 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 you know, cross out the answers that I said, there's no way leaving me with those one or two choices of it's gotta be one of these. So that would be my, my thought on it. Well, you just said it, be an active participant, you know, who, yeah. who wants to hang <laughs> with the slug, who wants to work for the, the officer that's a buffoon, who wants to work for the, the fire chief who embarrasses them out there and all that, you know, I think firefighters, I like it. I'm way too competitive in a good way. You know, who want, like we've said how many times who wants to wear the company logo t-shirt that says we suck less, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, you know, if you want to be part of something special contribute, just like you said, you know, contribute to be, to, to be part of part, you know, to make that place that, that special place where other people want to come and back to that best selling book, the functional fire company. Why do you want to be here? That kind of stuff. But this is a topic that I love. Um, I was just grading some proposals that have to do with preparing for the future. And I, and I always talk Freddie and Scott about 
we don't spend enough time on this. We don't. We we spend a whole lot of time, a whole lot of things, but we don't spend. We start off the show by saying we don't spend enough time investing in our people and their future to get to the next level. So I love it. I'm so glad we had you on, Freddie. Um, uh, you're you're a good guy. You're a good. You're you're the real McCoy, man. You're the real thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, folks out there that uh, are trying to figure out what they're doing in their career or what they're going to do. And you've been contributing forever and making a difference uh, in the fire service. And if I could I, share something really quick, I'm going to share this, this older book. Chief South is not here today, <laughs> but this book, this book was given to me by a trainee that I trained when he was a rookie firefighter and I was a Lieutenant. He gave me this book in 2004 and you talk about getting signed. He signed it for me. And this is, has always been one of my motivators is this and trying to pass that legacy forward and pay it forward so this book is chief Saka had it out in 2004 um and it was one of the books that that i quote in my book um some of your books chief lasky i, I quote you know I, I tried to again bring as many sources as possible but i, I wanted to bring that that in that you know, chief, chief Saka's book is the subtitle is leadership lessons right that's what it's all about so, so thank you so much for having me on, Chief Thompson. Your contributions were invaluable, and I appreciate them as well. Thank you, perfect, sir. Perfect. Thank you for yours. Well, hang in there, guys. Don't go away. So, uh, uh, Scott, if they want to get hold of you. Best Scott day. at fireserviceleadership.com. And also, if you want to download the mentoring um, packet, it's fireserviceleadership.com. It's free. Just go in and put in a little information. You can download it right away and use that any way that it will benefit you. If you have a hard time uh, – Downloading it, contact me, and I'll send it to you. Oh, freaking Stan. I know we push that, promote that all the time because that's an incredible tool. So thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm easy, chieflasky.com. Uh, we're all on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and everything else. Uh, this show will be watched by a ton of people when they post it later uh, or, or not live. Our next show for the Hump Day Hangout, the Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service with Scott and myself and our our partners, uh, Terry McGrath and John Salka. And when we get the big boss, Chief David Rhodes here, who's doing phenomenal. We love David. Um, our next show is August 16th. Fire Engineering always has some great hump day hangouts on Wednesday. And don't forget about the podcast in the evening. There's some incredible people doing some incredible stuff. Um, you know, I, I love listening to them. And, and it's just, it's, there's some great folks out there doing some great things. We always close all of our programs. It's very important saying that is, in closing, we always ask you to always keep the men and women armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. Please remember this. Never forgetting means just that. Never forgetting. Be safe. God bless you. We'll see you next time.